the naval campaign. We have been experimenting with a kind of the redheaded stepchild of the wargaming world. This is a naval campaign. As you can see, we've got a lovely blue lake, which it turns out is it's approximately the size of Lake Superior. I don't think we're doing a proper, na proper naval war game. We've shrunk everything way down. Our naval vessels are not quite going to be right. I've said it before. I'll say it again just to remind you guys. When you're dealing with warships sailing on a body of water this size, you don't have to pack enough supplies to go around the world. You need to pack about three to five days worth of supplies. You're never more than two days from port, which means you've got a lot more weight available for more important things, things more important than food, at least for a warship, things like cannons and shot and gunpowder. Usually the vessels that are sailing on a body of water like this, the Great Lakes, probably I'm thinking maybe like Lake Baikal, you know, that kind of thing. I guess maybe even some of the lakes in uh, in Africa, right? Tanganyika. But I, I don't know how, how many like major battles were fought on those lakes. There were major battles fought on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, which are... About this size, I want to say. Somewhere around there. About half the size of this map. I'm not doing that. I'm using just your standard naval vessels. So they are grossly undergunned for the body of water that we're doing here. And as we established in recent videos, we have no idea what we're doing because it's all very top secret. Very hush-hush. Naval wargaming is a serious challenge because you have to reinvent everything from scratch. Even the guys that know all this stuff don't really want to share a lot of information. So what we've done is we have kind of used Henry Hyde's wargaming campaigns as our guide and he's got a whole chapter on war at sea and we went to the dmg to find out movement rates because that's a really hard thing and in reviewing that i said you know what let's just let's stop right that henry's a smart guy he's been around the wargaming world for a long time he's a fighter he's a survivor we got a lot of respect for him he says look a typical speed for a man of war or merchant man the horse and musketer was five to ten knots okay great so five to ten knots we're going to call that about five miles an hour. And if you say five miles an hour, that's a typical speed. Hey, look at this. I have five mile hexes. That means a ship can typically move about 24 hexes. But we all know that if you're trying to sail this way and the wind is blowing this way, you got yourself a little problem. You're going to have to go up and down. So while you may still be able to travel 24 miles in the day, your net, your gross will be 24, but your net speed may be, well, let's just go ahead and count, right? We've got the hexes here. Let's suppose we're starting here at the little fishing. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then we come back down brrr, to that level. Well, we've only really moved 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, oh, 12. Look at that. So you're sailing at half speed. But, you know, the route of travel is you still covered 24 miles, but you're 24 hexes, but you only managed to make 10 hexes worth of headway in the direction you want it. So that's kind of one of the challenges that you have to deal with. All right. In our last video, we established that on day one of the campaign, the wind is going to be out of the west. It's going to be at a normal speed. Okay. No problem. Now, the other thing, I should, I'll point out one other thing. Rather than simply saying, well, you can move 24 hexes, but you can't move into the wind, we're also going to incorporate... A little bit more guidance that Henry provides here where he says, look, if you are traveling at, and it's, and, you know, I like bullet points, so I got to find it here in the, in the paragraph. Um, in a light breeze or moderate breeze, add 15% to your speed. Okay, so if you're traveling with the wind, that 24 hexes, we're going to bump up by three hexes. And if you're going against the wind, straight up, this is, I guess this is another way to do it. It says, uh, deduct 20% if sailing against it. So what we'll do, remember, wind is from the west. So what we'll do is we'll say, listen, if you are sailing to the northeast, southeast, northeast or southeast, you'll travel 24 hexes. If you're set, traveling due east, you'll get that three hex bump. If you're traveling to the, you, you can't sail directly west, can't sail directly into the wind, but you can sail northwest or southwest however we're going to give you that call it four hex deficit so you're only going to be traveling at 20 hexes per turn if you're going up against this isn't perfect now bear in mind that we're not doing like the full trigonometry that's involved with all of this what we're doing is we're trying to establish a map-based campaign that is simple enough that we can develop some engagements naturally 
but complicated enough to at least evoke the feeling of an admiral who's trying to take into account the fact that he's got prevailing winds out of the west or you know the captains and in our case we're going to have two fleets per side right so our the admiral of the two different fleets that we have are going to have to account for what their orders are now in the last video we only established two, what two of the fleets were doing we know that blue fleet one is going to start down here in water street and red fleet is going to start here in Lion's Rock. So let's take a look at what those fleets are. I went down and I, I went ahead and made up some rosters. And for the blue fleet, I've got uh, Commodore Nascati. And he's got a second rate, third, two thirds, and two fifth rates. So this is one of his patrol fleets. And it's the, uh, the, the BNS, so that's the Blue Navy ship. Meltzer and the Vidney. And I took these names from commenters on the, the videos. Then our third rates are going to be, oh, I'm sorry, second rate is the Meltzer, commanded by Commodore Nascati. Our third rates are going to be the Vidney and the Johnson, and then we've got the fifth rate, the BNS Flying Hangar, and the Ward Robe. We also have Commodore McMurray traveling. Now, this blue fleet, this is our merchant fleet. This fleet we know is going to start in Water Street, and it wants to get up to here. It wants to grab some minerals and get back to Water Street. So that's the primary mission. If they can do that, blue team wins. And they've got, like I said, we've got a merchant, we've got two small merchants, we've got a two fourth rates and three sixth, sixth rates. Okay, great. So we have our first fleet. Now, the red fleet has two patrols. The first of them is going to be uh, Fleet Gold, which is for Commodore uh, Cross. And then it has a first rate, third rate, two fifths, and two sixths. And those are in order. We've got the uh, RKS, right? So Red King's Ship, the Morgan, the Dean. We've got the Dan 9 and the Roble for the fifth rate ships. And then for the sixth rate. And we've all oh, we got a little Corvette. Isn't that cute? So, hey, RKS Wardlaw, you're a little, uh, you know, what is that, probably like a 12-gunner? 12, 12 Commodore Wiley is Red Fleet Silver. Again, we've got two more. Oh, wait, so what's Red Fleet trying to do? We didn't establish that. So Red Fleet has their own merchant men, and they've got you know, a small protective screen fleet that will help them. All right, so that's the other question then. Now, conveniently for us, we have a total of one, two, three, four resource points. Hello, let's go ahead and zoom in there just a little bit further. So as solo war gamers, what we're going to do to surprise ourselves and keep things interesting is we're going to make it random. The first thing I'm going to do is figure out, hey, Red Fleet, where do you want to go get some resources? And, oh, I should number them. One, two, three, four. And so looking at three, okay, that's good, because it means that the Red Fleet is trying to get to the manufactured parts here in this independent city that is unnamed. The other question is, Exactly which city are they going to start in? Red Fleet, let's use a red D6, shall we? And we're going to re-roll a 6 because we're not going to do Lion's Rock. Our our shipping fleet is going to start, and, this may, and we're not going to start in Solaton either. That gives us four possibilities we, because it would be too easy, right? Boop, boop, hey, we win. So we're going to start in 1, 2, 3, 4, and I guess that means we roll another die. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, House of Nine. So our Red Fleet 2, this is our Red Merchant Fleet, is going to start here. And they're trying to get to here. Meanwhile, our blue fleet is starting down here, our blue merchant fleet, and it's trying to get to here. So blue is really up against it. Red is sailing with the wind on this first day, so they should have a pretty easy go of things. The other thing we need to establish is where do our fleets, our, our call them our war fleets, begin? And so for the red, this one we can say, all right, listen, we've already got our merchant fleet in House of Nine. We'll go one, two, three, four, five, and then we'll reroll any sixes. And with the result of a two, it'll be one... Wait, we started... We already had Merchant here. Oh, no, we already know that, didn't we? I'm sorry. I, I, I take that back. Our war fleet starts in Lion's Rock. And we know our war fleet is going to come down here and patrol kind of in this zone right here. During... In the, I guess you'd call it the Narrows. Uh, the blue fleet, we know the Merchant fleet is starting here. And let's go one, two, three, four, five to find out where the war fleet begins. One, two. So our war fleet begins over here at Pancakes. And now we have four forces that all have different things they want to do. I, well, we do need to figure out how is the pancakes. We don't know what these merchant guys are going to do. So why don't we just send them out to patrol up here and just, you know, we'll just kind of keep them in this area. The other thing we should talk about is the fact that visibility is limited to one hex. And well, because it's a warship, we're actually going to call it two hexes. So a ship can see as far as two hexes out. I don't think that's right. You know, I was thinking about this, and I realized, you know, when we do a land-based campaign, like the Broman Empire, and we send armies marching across this map, we make the simplifying assumption that those armies have outriders. They have scouts protecting the flanks, 
scouting ahead a few miles so that the army isn't caught completely with their pants down. It occurred to me that the same process occurs here, where a fleet that is located in, and let's just say it's in this hex right here, is not just going to be confined to this five-mile hex. They may have their little packet ships out here who can also see two hexes. So really, we should be treating these guys as having not just being able to see the five miles to the horizon plus, because remember, they're tall ships. They can see a little over the horizon, that second hex. We should probably give them a three hex visibility. That gives them basically 20 miles in either direction, where you sight the scout ships of the opposing fleet. And then you, the game turns into one of those chases where one fleet may want to run. For example, a merchant fleet that catches sight of the war fleet is going to hoof it for the nearest safe port. Or, well, which may be, and we're going to call the, the neutral zones safe ports. Whereas the warship may pursue. And, you know, depending on who has the weather gauge, that may work great and it may not. I'm not sure. We need to actually sit down and do the math and run these numbers on who's going where. So on day one, as I said... We've got a, a wind speed. The wind is directly out of the west. And let's go ahead and figure out where our merchant ships are going to go. As I said, and, and it would be great if a book like this actually listed out all of these speeds. Hey, assuming a normal speed of 15 knots, you can move what wind strength according to... Well, that's, that's percentages. But I have to figure out all of this on my own. So really, I probably, before I actually film this video, I probably should have worked this out. But I didn't. So what we'll do is we'll say on day one, if you are traveling, here's our blue merchant fleet. He can move 24 hexes. Except because he's sailing into the wind, he can only move 20 hexes. Which means he's going to go, his path is going to carry him 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So he's going to wind up right here at the end of the day. Okay, and I'm actually going to go ahead and draw a line that shows his path. He's making just a beeline. Now let's figure out where that red merchant fleet is going to be. And because he is traveling, as long as he travels downwind, he gains that bonus speed of 33%. Wait, if you're sailing with the wind, oh, and you've got a moderate breeze or better. So you don't get the bonus if there's only a light breeze. We can move, normally it would be 24, that's 120 miles. Uh, we get a 33% bonus. Oh, that's an extra eight hexes. However, our map is really small, and as you can see, there's not 32 hexes in this direction. Well, okay, so what does that mean? Well, if we have a 33% boost, then I guess that means for every three hexes we could normally travel, we can now travel four. In other words, there's a lot of different ways to kind of work the math, but what I would suggest is here... Our, traveling at our 24, we go 1, 2, 3, and then we get our bonus because we're being pushed by the wind. And then we go 4, 5, 6, and we get our bonus because we're traveling with the wind. And then we go 7, 8, 9, and we get our bonus because we're traveling with the wind. So the, even though we've moved a total of 10 hexes, it only, wait, 1, 2, 3, and a bonus. 4, 5, 6, and a bonus. So, so we've actually covered 12 hexes despite only using 9 of our movement points if we want to use it that way. So we've used nine movement points. Now that we're going to shift direction and travel kind of with the wind, nine, 24, our normal 24 minus nine, we still get to move another 15 hexes. So we picked up three bonus hexes by traveling with the wind as far as we did. And then we're going to come down. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So here's the red merchant fleet. And they are directly online tomorrow morning to hit the port that they wanted to get to. All right, but that's the easy part because then we also have to figure out our strategy for the warships over here. Now, oh, oh, spaghettios, they're downwind down here at Pancakes. And this is, uh, let's, let's put some names to it, Commodore Nescati. So this is Commodore McMurray. Commodore Nescati up here has got a problem. If he wants to sail straight out, he's going directly into the wind going to reduce his speed by half. In order to take advantage of his ship's sailing capabilities, he's going to have to take... Now, and like I said, it, it actually doesn't matter, but we should probably decide. Is he doing a lot of little tacking, or is he coming down and going up? And I think maybe what we do is we say, look, if we sail in this direction, for every three hexes we travel, we really only move two hexes. 
So in other words, this would be one, two, three, because they're sailing into the wind, four, five, six, because they're sailing into the wind, and then we want to come down here, seven, eight, nine, and then coming back up into the wind, it's going to be the same thing. Nine, 10, 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh-oh, now, we, now we're getting too close to the shore, right? So we're going to go 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And then, oh boy, so we still have three more. And that would put them right here at the end of the day. Except check this out. At this point, this is where things get a little, even a little more complicated. He still has one and a half movement points and he's caught sight of the merchant vessel. But they have the weather gauge. So what does that mean? Well, he can he doesn't quite have the movement. So let's put him right here at the end of the day. All right? And 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 we'll punt. We're going to worry about that tomorrow. We're going to go see what happened to the Red War Fleet who decided to come down here and patrol in this area. And that Red War Fleet is going to be in the same situation where, you know, they're cutting along this way and then they cut along this way. Now, what I want to do to keep it random and find out if they actually intercept this merchant vessel is I'm going to guess at how many hexes they want to move in this direction. And I'll actually go ahead and do one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the question is, how many more hexes do they move? I'm going to roll a d6. They're going to want to move four more hexes. So we've moved six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So they're going to stop right here, and they've moved, used half their movement allowance. And then they can come down... So that's at 12, and then it's going to be 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So this is where they would end the day normally, except, hey, wait a second. Don't they meet somewhere in here? Yeah, they do. And now we run into the other situation where naval campaigns get really complicated because... In a normal campaign where you have this kind of movement, it's it's a lot easier to figure out where these guys meet. Armies on the hoof move at the same general speed. If I've got two armies located right here, and they're marching toward each other at the same rate, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. If one of them is moving here and the other one's on an intercept course, or even if he veers up, you can kind of estimate where they meet. Now bear in mind, we've got a huge white space here that we have to figure out what the actual terrain is on the ground. Here, not so much. And oh, by the way, you know what I forgot? Because this Navy, because Commodore, what do we got here? Fleet Silver? No, this is Fleet Gold. Uh, Commodore uh, Cross, for the second half, he doesn't suffer the penalty. He's actually sailing with the wind now. So he could actually move another one, two, three spaces. So here's where he ends day one, except that he catches sight of these guys somewhere in here and the end and the question then becomes well where and to answer that question we have to do a little bit of iteration by midday the red fleet is located in this hex one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve by midday the blue fleet is located right here okay so then we go well these guys are going to go one two three one two oh, one so right about here is where they are going to meet and in this case, again, I don't want to be too disruptive about this. Well, the question is, Red Fleet is going to pursue Blue Fleet. Blue Fleet wants to escape. Blue Fleet is, Fleet is upwind. Technically, they have the weather gauge. The problem is that Red Fleet is going to pursue them. So let's tighten things up and talk about exactly what that means. At the moment, they catch sight of each other. And I think given our little assumption that they can see two hexes, it's probably going to happen... Well, we, we, we have to iterate here. So the fleets will be here and here on the same day, and they can't see each other. When they reach this point, this is when they reach each other. And the blue fleet says, uh, nope. Now, I kind of think red fleet has the weather gauge at this point. Because they're going to be able to, well, if the Red Fleet moves here to intercept, Blue Fleet can run directly into the wind. And remember, they're moving at the same speed. So now we get into the real meat of the issue, where having reached this point and set course to intercept, 
Red Fleet still has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine movement points available to them. And the by by extension, so does blue. So blue's only going to be able to run one, two, three, four, well, four and a half. Let's call it right here. And this is where Blue Fleet really ends the day. So we rewind the clock, and Red Fleet says, okay, great. Uh, do we go, do we one, two, three? So they moved there, and these guys have moved to here and there. So they're going to be right here. So here's Red Fleet, and let's, let's use the, the letter here because I keep forgetting which one it is. This is going to be Red Fleet Gold is going to be right here. So the War Fleet is in hot pursuit. They're only 10 miles away from each other. At the start of day two, notice that if the wind doesn't shift, Blue Fleet is in trouble. They're going to run out of room before Red Fleet. And if they run down this way, you know, we may wind up having Blue Fleet. They may wind up being forced to do battle down in this area somewhere. But let's set that aside for the moment. Because the other issue we have to figure out is at the end of the day, we've got these two fleets. And Blue Fleet is, oh, I've got black and gray is what we call these guys. So the War Fleet for Blue is going to be... Fleet Black. So blue is the new black. There we go. So there's black, and here's our merchants. And we have the same situation where, day two, let's talk about the weather first. We're going to roll 2d6 on use this little chart. And we get a 6, which means the wind veers 30 degrees. Wait, what does veer mean? What's the difference between veer and back? On the other side, I'm not showing you for copyright reasons. We've got the wind backing 30 degrees. What the heck? And then we also have another chart. We'll figure that out. It's going to veer 30. We also have another chart for whether, what happens to the... So we're at moderate right now. We roll 2d6 to find out whether the wind increases or not. And we roll a 10, which means the weather improves by two categories. Helpfully, our old friend Henry Hyde explains that to veer is to change clockwise. It's actually in the sentence right above that. All right, so we are going to change the wind direction clockwise by 30 degrees. Hey, conveniently enough... That means that the wind is going to be moving from due west clockwise and makes it to the southwest. I'll write that down. Now, what does improve versus worsen mean? I think it depends on the era. In our case, uh, it's going to change one category. And what, I'm just going to, to, to make it easy to remember, because this is lower, I'm going to say the improvement means that it goes from moderate, two categories up, so it turns to a gale force winds. And if it worsens, we're going to go back up the chart. See, because worsens is on the top and improves is on the better on the on the bottom. So there you go. So we go from moderate to gale force winds, and it's we're going to call it uh, 20, 25 knots. So on day two, it's going to be twenty five, and it's not kn. That's that's an n, not kilometers. Twenty five knots to the southwest. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well. For every turn that a ship is sailing in gale force winds, there is a one in six chance that it sinks. I'm going to roll six dice here, and I'm going to try to roll them in order so that we can figure out exactly which one. On a one, the ship is, is so badly damaged that it has to limp to port. So the Red Fleet loses their first rate and one of their fifth rates to damage. Is it sunk? I don't know. It's out of the campaign, though. And then we're going to roll, we've got one, two, three. We're going to roll three for the merchantmen, top to bottom. So we lost one of our small merchantmen. And then I've got four ships. And again, I'm just going to roll them and kind of try to roll them in a column so that we know that the RKS Young is badly damaged. Over on this side, we've got five vessels for Fleet Blue. The, I'm sorry, Blue Fleet in the black. And we get they lose their best vessel, their second rate, the BNS Meltzer. Took a rogue wave and is no more. We've got three merchantmen who are okay. And then we've got five more ships to protect them. And anyone that rolls a one. So we lost a couple more vessels due to the storm. Our best merchantman, Blue's best merchantman, and one of their sixth rates, the BNS Hethwill, is badly damaged and has to limp back to port. So we've already suffered some casualties here in our campaign due to weather. I guess that makes sense. Red Fleet Silver, because of the weather, realizes and having caught sight of the Blue Fleet Gray, the warships, has decided we need to get back to Solon, Solaton. Blue Fleet, of course, is going to attempt to intercept. Here's the difference. 
by sailing directly with the wind at their back, the blue, red fleet is going to be able to go one, two, three, and then cut up four, five, six, seven, and they're going to be able to make harbor like so. The blue fleet attempting to intercept because they are sailing not quite with the wind. They're sailing at 30 degrees to the wind. They are going to reach Blue Fleet a little bit late. They are sailing at a slower rate as they move here to the northwest, which is, remember, now that's with the wind, so they don't have any penalties, but one, two, three, four, and then five, six. Well, actually, these guys, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, they're going to be able to reach. So that's going to be where we're at at the end of day one. And because we don't want to get within 10 miles of the coast, we're going to end the blue fleet right here. That's going to be where they end the day. They say, you know what? We'll just go ahead and blockade Soliton. Easy peasy. What about these guys here? Well, now we've got a situation where both fleets, um, normally blue, would love to sail directly with the wind. But they can't do that because the Red Fleet is blocking them out from that. So how are they going to run? Well, the only real option they have, because they can't go to the south now. Remember, there's in a gale force, you cannot sail directly into the wind. That's one of the penalties of having those high winds. So they could continue to sail slowly in this direction, but they're going to run out of coast. If they sail this 30 degrees off the wind... They won't suffer a penalty, but they're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And right about here, they're going to realize that they're in trouble. So right here is where they say, you know what? We aren't going to be able to make that turn because the Red Fleet is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And is still going to block them out and is waiting for them to make their move. Still can't cut across the bows of these guys without risking an engagement. Can't go this way because the gale force winds. They're going to be forced to sail in this direction. And they are going to be penalized that 30%. So how far can they make it? Well, normally they can move 12, but this time it's only 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So they're running out of ocean here. And I think this is probably where the fascination with naval campaigns begins. What do you do? Okay, now things get a little bit more interesting because our Red Fleet, they're going to run into the coast. They can't afford to do that. They can't sail directly into the wind. So as they pursue, they'll reach here. And then, and then what do you do? Do you assert you can't get back over? So they're going to have to cut, oh, what, this way and then this way? No, because they can't go that way. So they're going to have to cut back one, two, three. Four, five, and then six, they're penalized, remember, because they're sailing across the wind. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So they've lost a hex in pursuit. That is the route that they're going to have to take in order to stay uh, in pursuit of these guys. But they are they are getting them cornered. And I think this is part of the idea of the lake. Wars is the blue has a, an extreme disadvantage that all of their cities are tucked down here on the bottom part of the map. Red cities are much further scattered, but there's a lot more of the blue area where they are within racing distance of a safe harbor. That may be the difference that strategically blue is is really up against the wall here. Be that as it may, we're going to roll two d6. The red dice will be for the direction, and the blue dice will be for the change in speed. With a result of a 6, we are still stuck in the gale force winds. Uh, and with a result of an 8, for that, we are going to be the wind backs 30 degrees, meaning that the wind returns to due west. But it is still gale force. So what does that mean for our navies? Well, we're going to just maintain this blockade down here. Ah, oh, but we're still at gale force winds. Every day you're not in port. Oh boy, this may be a problem for the Red Fleet. Do they need to sail back to port? I think they do. I think having chased these guys into Soliton, their best bet might have been to sail back down to uh, Pancakes down here. Huh? That's definitely what they're going to do, at least the survivors of today's sailing. The Blue Fleet, we got to roll four dice, and we'll see if we get any ones. We did. Once again, the best ship is gone. So that Blue Fleet has lost a third rate. They're down to a third, a fifth, and a fifth. 
And having, you know, enforced their, their protection of the waters, they're going to sail back to Pancakes, let's say. Wind is now out of the due west, so one, two, three, four, five, and then, you know, it doesn't really matter. They're going to be safe. So we've got our war fleet here ready to sail out and uh, protect, you know, blockade this again tomorrow if the weather is a little bit better. These guys are duty-bound to take care of each other. Well, what does that mean? Well, now the wind is due west. So we we do have the option of the blue fleet can sail up this way, but eventually they're going to have to turn to the west. And red fleet is definitely going to simply shadow them as they turn. You know, red fleet has that... Um, well, red fleet can't see them right now, right? So the question is, what does red fleet do? I think red fleet just pursues them until they turn, because once blue turns, red fleet will be two hexes away, and they'll be able to identify them. So we are going to definitely have a battle somewhere in this region right here. And to figure out which, I'm going to go ahead and just say, you know what? These guys are going to sail up to here. They're going to run out of room, and somewhere in here, let's just call it right there. And I'm going to roll... Uh, D6 and just go around the horn one through six to find out where So around the horn one two three four so right here is where these two fleets come into contact with each other And now we finally do have a battle The exact routes don't matter. This is the location of the fight How do we do fights? Well, let's take a look at our rosters first of all We have a oh do we have a third? Oh, we got. We forgot to roll to see who survives this turn outside of the harbor. We're going to roll four dice. Any ones? So the Red War Fleet is going to be just fine. We've got a third rate, a fifth, a sixth, and a Corvette. And then down here, we've got... Uh, let's roll two dice for our Merchantmen. And we lost another Merchantman. Oh, man. So we're down to just one small Merchantman. And then we've got four remaining War Vessels. And we lost another war vessel. So these two fleets have really taken a beating. And we've got a fourth, fourth, and a sixth. Hey, now, look at that. We've got a war game, don't we? We've got three war vessels versus... and it, So it's a third, a fifth, and a sixth versus a two-fourths and a sixth. Hey, that's kind of fair, isn't it? Two-fourths and a sixth versus a three, five, and a six? Huh. Plus a Corvette, plus a merchant. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to protect the merchant man, I guess. Although it is empty, so what are you going to do? Not only that, but we now know that the wind is going to be out of the west. So the wind is out of the west, and it is gale force winds. Hey, these are all things that we can translate to the tabletop. We now have a naval campaign that generated a tabletop battle. Isn't that great? I know that was a lot of math and kind of working through a lot of different things, but now we get to shift to a more traditional tabletop game, and it will have a lot more import because if our protectors are able to protect that merchant man and drive off or capture a couple of these warships, they'll have a free run up. So maybe this was a good idea after all. It's a shame about the weather, but hey, you roll your dice, you move your mice, and this kind of thing happens all the time. Ask the Japanese about weather protecting them. Huh? Huh? Ask, ask the Mongols whether weather makes a difference in naval battles. They'll tell you. Hey, until next time, I'm praying for you.